Franz Held, il dottor Franz Held ha studiato metallografia al Max Planck Institute di Stoccarda, ha lavorato per diverse aziende di affinazione metalli preziosi, degussa e Merle Mail, e ha una lunga esperienza nella ricerca pratica. Lavora presso il Dipartimento di Metallurgia Fisica all'Istituto di Ricerca per i Metalli Preziosi e Chimica dei Metalli FEM di Schwebischem in Germania. Il titolo della memoria è Comprendere le proprietà e migliorare il trattamento delle leghe d'argento. Le leghe d'argento sono ampiamente usate nel settore della gioielleria e presentano specifici problemi a livello di produzione. Il presente documento si propone di fornire ai produttori di articoli in argento e agli orafi delle linee guida per ottenere prodotti di qualità con un livello di scarto ridotto. Prego, dottor Rep. Hello, that, uh, this is the name of our presentation, Understanding Properties and Improving the Processing of Silver Alloys. When we start with the presentation, we found that Dr. Aldo Reti makes someone in the same theme, and uh, this was what we think when we start. Have we fully understanding sil sterling silver? Not yet. Or did we have it forgotten? What you will hear is uh, the parts, it's motivation. It's the basic properties of silver and its alloying elements, so melting and casting, thermomechanical treatment, further processing step, influence of alloy addition, and summary. Uh, the motivation to make this presentation was uh, typical discussion with partners in projects, goldsmiths in education and work, and customers of FEM. And, uh, The typical topics was always fire stain, blue silver, spongy surface after annealing, porosity, and cracks. Here you see the ring with the blue silver, a lot of known. Basic properties of silver alloys, the most used element is copper. We have binary face diagrams of uh, silver copper. Here it's a shale simulation. What it is, is uh, you see the marked lines is the equilum and the continuous lines are the non-equilibrium, which is in the practice normal use. So if we have different silver copper alloys and we cast it, it starts to solidify and then We have here the attactic phase, and so here we have time where it get frozen. We only want to look for this area, and uh, we know we always talk about silver 925, uh, but that's a hallmark. Uh, the used silver, it's for soldering and this, It depends, it could be 925, but it also could be 935. And so we have here this range. That's a typical microstructure picture from sterling silver. We have here solid solution. We have the atactic phase and micro shrinkage porosity here. Here the same silver, your tactic phase, but no micro shrinkage. Uh, what we most use is we want to look how oxygen can get in soli uh, solubility and solid silver. It's so that uh, we have here the blue line. It's uh, what we normal can make analysis. We only can analyze if the uh, oxide is higher than 10 ppm. If it lower, we cannot analyze. So this we cross with about 600 degrees, and then we see that the oxygen solubility in silver increase very fast. And uh, we have 40 
50, 60, 70 ppm. It also depends on the pressure we work. Here we have the diffusion of two things. We have a substitutional diffusion that's for the metals. And uh, we see that if we, this is silver, this is copper, copper have to change the place with silver, though this is, the diffusion is slowlier. If you look for oxygen and hydrogen, it's the interstitial diffusion, though this goes between these elements and pass then can go much faster because uh, ox uh, oxygen and hydrogen have a much smaller atomic radius. This is possible to go fast. Here you see it, the diffusion, that's the metal, silver, copper, here hydrogen, oxygen, oh, this is hydrogen, gen, oxygen, silver, copper, and here up hydrogen and oxygen, which goes much faster in the diffusion. So oxygen diffusion a million times faster than silver copper at 660 degrees, though you will see what could be this. So here we have the diffusion depth of oxygen in silver as function of, of temperature and time. Here, oxygen concentration, the distance on different temperature, so you see here our 10 ppm line for measurement. And uh, you see, so higher the temperature, so higher the oxygen concentration. Here, other picture, you can see oxygen concentration in ppm. And the distance oxygen can move during annealing. And uh, if we look 750 degrees, one minute, here, and then in 30 minutes, it can walk up to two and a half millimeter. If we look uh, for ring shanks, it's around this size. So in a very short time, it can, oxygen can pass this. This was the material we use for tests, beginning with electrolytic silver, the oxygen contents around 400 ppm, which is very high. If we use granulation material, oxygen is about 250, but it depending on the granules, it could be you have only have 200, but you also can have 300, 350 ppm oxygen. <coughs> Best material is if we use vacuum melted silver, the oxygen content is uh, smaller than 10 ppm, but the most people will use granules and make the alloys themselves during melting. Uh, here we have gas pores in silver granules. That's a silver granule. And uh, we see here the small pores. If we look for better uh, prepared samples and we look only on the grain boundaries, we see here the typical problem with oxygen and hydrogen in silver. And this is found in granules. So we know granules contains oxygen and hydrogen for we make the cooling down for s liquid silver in water. So we have both oxygen and hydrogen. This is the talked about the method of oxygen in silver, how we can measure. We have annealed this granules in forming gas, which contains 10% hydrogen. We make the annealing about 700, 800 degrees. And we have inspection by metallographic cross-section. Uh, we also know bead and sputter tests as something out of the industry. What they do is if you use special soldering material, which is uh, silver copper at the tactic phase, they make annealing under forming gas or poor hydrogen and look if they spray it. 
And if the uh, sputtering of silver is in the area, they know oxygen are inside. Okay. Here we have three granules left. It's annealed in forging gas. In the middle, it's annealed in argon. And right, it's annealed in air. What we thought is, okay, uh, if we make annealing under forming gas, we know if oxygen in it. If we make annealing in argon and we get the bubbles, then we know it's hydrogen and oxygen in its uh, granules. And if we make it in air, we know that hydrogen is in it. And so we see <coughs> the granule which we annealed under forming gas get, uh, it lost the shiny and we see on the surface a lot of pores. We make here a cut with focus ion beams and we see that there's pores in the granules, argon atmosphere on the surface. There was <coughs> on the top surface no reaction. What's happened is uh, if we make annealing in forming gas, we have 10% hydrogen it, and we have the oxygen in the metal. So this is metal, this is the atmosphere. If we make the annealing in argon, we have oxygen and hydrogen. If we make in air, we also oxygen from the air and hydrogen <coughs> in the granule. This is what's happened. Two hydrogen atoms used with one oxygen atom uh, water and you have the water steam because you have the high temperature and you get the bubbles in it. You also can have free gas, but the most is used the water steam. And this is doesn't matter if you use hydrogen, argon, or air. You have it in all three atmospheres, but in uh, forming gas, you have the most, so we know that there is much more oxygen in the granule than hydrogen. This is metallographic cross-section of the granules. And uh, you see here, forming gas, you have the most porosity from water steaming. Argon, you also have the porosity. And in air, and this looks not very fine. This is not what we want to use. Processing of silver alloys is, uh, in this time, the most used continuous melting casting equipments with, you can make atmosphere controlled, you can make vacuum, gas, argon, whatever you want. With uh, the continuous casting, you have temperature control during casting. You have no shrinkage porosity, continuous quality through the whole batch. If we look for melting and casting in workshops, you have small ovens or by talk. And uh, yeah, it's a simple equipment. It's melting, casting under air, covering with borax, and uh, we get oxidation. No temperature control, shrinking porosity is possible. Uh, how you can solve the bad things of this way of working. If you use high purity silver, you use oxygen. Or there's no uh, standard describing maximum oxygen in uh, silver. Detection limit is about 10 micron. Oxygen in solid solution ever pours during melting in vacuum. And a vacuum melting sheet material is preferred over granules. Cooper, it's, uh, you should use high purity copper. On copper, we have uh, different <coughs> hallmarks <or> so <laughs> for the oxygen containing. You use uh, poor copper, oxygen free copper, or oxygen free copper electronic. You see here you have 0.04% uh, oxygen in copper. If you use oxygen free copper, you only have 0.001%. And if you use oxygen free electronic, you have 
5% oxygen. This is the best quality you can use and uh, the result is clear. Uh, so the general comments of increasing casting quality of silver alloy is use a graphite crucible, that's normal. Use of oxygen free reduced material as wire and sheets. So I know um, it's easier to take granules, but if you use material which is molten before, the oxygen have left the silver. If granules are used, evacuate the melting chamber when the material is molting so that you take out all the oxygen of the silver, add alloying material such as copper or other when silver is molten. Uh, it's not so easy, but uh, we have seen that oxygen or silver open the door for oxygen higher than 600 degrees. If silver is molten, the oxygen goes out of the silver. If we have a crucible with silver granules, copper pieces or other pre-element of silicon containing, then this starts to oxidize during the silver gives the oxygen away. And sometimes you are wondering about the slack in crucibles. Could be it's a high oxygen containing of the granules. For the goldsmith, it's so how he can make in small batches a high quality. Heat up the graphite crucible before filling the material. The crucible produces his own reducing CO atmosphere. Insert silver granules while mixing with a graphite rod. So the oxide goes out of the silver melt and then add alloying materials such as copper or acid when the silver is molten. Heat treatment of sterling silver alloys, it's also difficult for some oxidation. Uh, we have three different principal heat treatments. Homogenization, hardening, it's a two-step treatment, short-term annealing, long-term annealing. And we have homogenization, recrystallization, hardening, bracing. Uh, here you have different temperature hardening, it's about 300 degrees, we have heard before. Then we have long-term annealing, which means this is uh, annealing about hours. Short-term annealing, it depends on short or few minutes, and homogenization also short. The way uh, short-term, long-term annealing, we thought it depends on the furnace we use. We have a hot furnace. This is with a lower temperature. Long term, cooling is slow cooling, closed chamber with inert gas, and we use it for recrystallization. We have the muffle furnace, temperature up to 800 degrees, time medium short, quenching in water, flowing inert gas, and we use recrystallization, homogenization, hardening, bracing and continuous furnace. This is the short-term annealing, slow cooling, quenching in water, flowing in at gas, recrystallization, homogenization, natural hardening, and bracing will do there. This annealing, also called plank annealing, because there is no oxidation. Here you see the furnaces for the different annealings. That's the hot oven you use for large batches, so you need a long time to heat it up, and that's the long-term annealing. Muffle furnace, it, uh, it's a shorter time, up to 30 minutes. We can here quench in water, or we have the continuous furnace. That's here, the furnace. You only have a thin sheet or so that you anneal here, so it's in a few minutes uh, annealing is done. Here we have again homogenization, short annealing, annealing. Here we show, want to show you have a short heat, uh, yeah, short heat up. You keep it, you go down. That's continuous furnace. Here you cannot quench so easy. Then you have the hot furnace. Oh no, the muffle furnace. It's uh, <coughs> the second in heating up. 
you keep for a short time. Here you can make the quenching in water so that you can later make a hardening. And you have the muffled furnace, longest time to heat up, but also long time to heat because you use a big volume of material and then cooling down also slowly. This is <coughs> grain size after short term treatment effect of the silver content. So we say, okay, we have used these three alloys because these are used with the goldsmiths. We have here temperature, we have here the grain size, and you see that grain size 700 degrees annealing, no big difference. The difference comes if we come up to 750 degrees or higher. This is a microstructure we see here, very small. Grain sizes, we use also small grain sizes, a little bit uh, uh, grain size growing, but here we see the copper phase, and this is a grain size limiter. In gold, we will use iridium to get small grain sizes. If we get higher to 750 degrees, grain size really start to grow because we s are missing this copper phase lines. Effect of deformation and annealing on the grain size depending on the copper content. Microstructure of different alloy composition. Heat treatment is all 750 degrees, 30 minutes quenched in argon. And you see if we use 925, remember the diagram, you have the most copper phase in it, 930, 935, and you see the grain growing. And this also is for orange peel effect. Effect of heat treatment conditions on the hardness of 925 silver cooper alloy, hardening degrees with increasing annealing temperature. So you have here 300 degrees, and you see if you want to remove the hardness from cold rolling, it goes down with the temperature, and if we have 400, 500 degrees, we are very low. Sure, we get lower if we go to the higher uh, annealing temperature, but if we use annealing and quench in water, we get lower. If we make annealing and take it out of the oven and lay it somewhere, we see that the hardness increased again, and we get up to 100 or more than 100 wickers. That's a self-hardening effect <coughs> if we don't quench in water and use high temperature. It starts with about 600 degrees and it increases with higher temperatures. So high annealing temperature for the goldsmith if you don't quench in water only make could make it harder and you get also uh, oxidation. So that's the point we want to explain. Here we have 925, we have 935. Here the, uh, the temperature, and this is solu the solid solution of copper in silver increases with higher temperature. And this is what we have talked, grain size, recrystallization, hardness, natural hardening, it's here. Here it's uh, the grain size, you see, if we anneal in this temperature range, there is no grain growing, only if we have no copper phase in it, uh, the grain growing starts. Here again, <coughs> the solution of copper differing during different heat treatments. Seven hundred, and if we make a high annealing, we have no copper, and then we have the really grain growing. Uh, this is the fire stain formation during heat treatment. We use all annealing time thirty minutes in this line, and we use uh, different temperature. It goes from five hundred, seven hundred fifty degrees, and the annealing was done 
under argon and we take the specimens out. No annealing was done under air here. And though we see the oxidation goes very fast, we have, if we make a half hour annealing under 750 degrees, we have here 60 microns. If we use only 500 degrees, we know hardness also goes down, but we have no oxidation on the top. We have made this annealing 750 degrees, 30 minutes under air. We see this uh, thickness of oxidation. Then we make a reduction annealing with uh, one hour with forming gas and we see all the porosity that this is thicker than this one makes only that the silver blow up with the pores with the water steam and so it seems thicker but it's the same specimen we used and the oxide thickness you see here oxide layer of thickness in microns <coughs> with temperature and uh, it's so that the 935 get a little bit deeper than the 925 but uh, what's happened is we have here less copper so the copper oxidation goes faster in the depths comparison of oxidation behavior of silver and gold alloys we have been this so we know if we make annealing silver under uh, oxygen atmosphere we get this fire stain thickness if we make it the same with uh, 7050 yellow gold we only see a small layer of oxidation and this is copper oxide which is done on the top surface but there's normal no insert oxidation after annealing if we make a polishing of this material we see we have to remove less material if we look here so higher we make the annealing so more we have to remove to get no or to see higher stain that's for the goldsmiths only typical temperatures colors and here oxidation solubility from oxygen in silver you see if you make it with low temperature you are low if you increase temperature you really have a lot of oxygen in your material example for typical jewelry defects is the fire stain <coughs> As cast ring with stone at the beginning of the polishing, blue sta bluish stain that cannot be removed by polishing, color change caused by oxidation of copper. Copper oxide is embedded in a silver matrix and depths of several tens of migrants. You cannot remove. That's a surface picture. After polishing, you see here normal material as we want to have it here fire stain which means it's silver with copper oxide this was this area uh, yeah normal if we want to remove fire stain it's possible but if you have here a line to for designing you see you can polish here on the top surface but not inside of the line so this will shiny blue and the rest which is silver a typical way to yeah, to make away fire stain it's not polishing all the fire stain away it's easier to make a fine silver coating <coughs> with a few microns and then you can't see the fire stain because you have a coating on it uh, examples of jubilee, jewelry defects fire stain we get from one customer we get a sprue system and we can break it very easy you see the whole sprue 
or the main screw, it's a shrinkage porosity with a lot of Cooper rocks, right? And we, or the customer send us this because he starts to have problems during casting. Uh, he make a self refinering, he melt it up and make casting in a graphite form. He remove a lot of copper slack of the crucible but what he have done is copper slack was in the crucible and the melt what he have casted was only or was up to 945 silver containing and then you lost uh, uh, the feeling about the casting temperature how you can do it make a refining if under forming gas or poor hydrogen forming gas will be enough during melting and copper will reduce so you contain the copper as copper in <coughs> your material influence of alloy addition we get a part from a partner in a research project this was done by selective laser melting in 930 silver and uh, he want to make some annealing he makes the annealing with a normal material hard soldering material which means a melting temperature about 780 degrees what's happened the part the part uh, change the contours and uh, if you make a microstructure we see that there is a lot of germanium phase in it that's typical for selective laser melting materials and uh, <coughs> it only so that we have now a lot of silver alloys on the market we have silver copper some persons use silver copper zinc for selective lacing melting we have germanium in it if we, you have a material where you buy or where you got from the refining company or manufacturer before you make any soldering ask him about the soldering material in this case if the guy will have asked the company he get the information use lower melting materials if I say this to this man who make this part he said yes after the emulation the part I have phoned to this company and they said oh no you need a special soldering material so sometimes discussion is good what you here see is uh, that's the surface of a sheet of metal there was copper oxide in it under the surface we make annealing with hydrogen and you get water steam reaction here and it looks like a mushroom surface and uh, yeah here again sterling silver here the range of our alloys here hardness here oxidation and so if not necessary make the whole annealing and working on temperature below 600 degrees you have no oxidation but you have soft material you can work with it if you go to higher temperature and you have a bad atmosphere you get the oxidation you have to remove could be you have a self-hardening which is also not very well for if you have to work longer and uh, this was the presentation the summary I want to say thank you to the Gore group and JTF to stay here and make the presentation hope you enjoy it hope you have learned a little bit about silver and that was Thank you.